All right, let's go to John the ch- uh, chapter 4. By the way, Luke, uh, Luke Betcher was there, um, did a great job on counseling, being with the boys. It just, uh, and then Gable and his friends, uh, a whole bunch of Eliana, a whole bunch of them came over on Wednesday night and that, just to help out with the uh, optional course. It was really awesome. I, I don't know. I just want to say again, I'm just so stinking proud of uh, the People Believers Fellowship and, and the people of God, just the family of God. You know, there's a lot of people just badmouth the church, badmouth the uh, Christians all the time saying we're not not doing good enough or we got to do better. No, we sure we want to grow up. Sure we want to do better. But pat yourself on the back and say I'm I'm not doing so bad. Jesus saved me, and I'm doing okay. Well, I found out with my iPhone that you can download the Bible, which I did on my little iTouch. But then I found out there's a little thing that had a little speaker down there, and I hit that button, and all of a sudden there's a guy reading to me the Bible. And then I plugged it in my car and came through my stereo system, and it's just like, man, I remember when you had to pack around the cassette players, you know, and, and fast forward and all that. And anyway, I started listening to John all week, and so I couldn't help myself. I, I want to read it to you. John, the fourth chapter. When, therefore, the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and departed for, again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called uh, Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore... Being weary from, the, from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Do you know sometimes we don't stop just to... Well, I, you know, I've read this over and over, but when the guy read it to me through my iPhone into my stereo system, and said Jesus was weary. I mean, this is something I've got underlined in my Bible, but it was just, you know, it really touched me that Jesus was in a physical body that got weary. He sat down. He says, I'm tired. It's been a long day. His feet were dirty. I don't know about you, but it just sometimes blows me away that Jesus actually had to live in this body after being in glory and then being confined to it. Whew. And yet here was the, all the power of God, all the plans of God are, are dependent on this body that Jesus is in. And I don't know, but if you get tired or weary and get grumpy sometimes, at least know that Jesus did, he didn't, maybe didn't get grumpy, but he did get weary. So you come to verse 7. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman therefore said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink, since I am a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Now, the paradox here of Jesus slowing down, sitting down by a well because he's weary, sending his disciples to go buy some food. He didn't multiply the fish every day, did he? They had a budget. They had had an accountant who was a thief. And by the way, he knew he was a thief all along and still let him be an accountant. That ought to encourage some of you about some of your employees and why you still have them. Um, and, but all of a sudden, then, he, then this woman comes, and he said, and if you knew who you were talking, if you knew who you were talking to, if you knew the gift that I am to you, you would ask me for a drink of living water. And she said, by the way, you know, for him to just talk to a woman was not custom. For him to talk to a Samaritan woman was really bad. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get this, that, that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him 
shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's what's happening in your life. You have drank of the living water, and it has become a well inside of you, springing up to eternal life. And remember what eternal life is. John 17, 3 says, eternal life is knowing God. The water that you have from Jesus is springing up in you every day, bringing you what? Into more knowledge or intimacy of, of relationship with the Father. Do you know this little Colton, when, uh, they, they were discussing it in church, or some of the little boy that went to heaven... Uh, somewhere they're discussing about why Jesus died. It was Good Friday and all that. And they said to his sister, you know, somebody was saying, do you know why, uh, why Jesus died? And uh, then they said to Colton, they said, do you know why Jesus died? He said, yeah, Jesus told me. For three minutes, this kid really had a heck of an experience. He said, Jesus told me. He says, what he, and dad said, well, what did he tell you? Now, his dad's a pastor. He said, what did he tell you? Well, Jesus said he died for me so that I could know, so I could get to see his, his, his dad. In fact, I might have wrote that down so I got that right. He died so we could see his dad. And this pastor said, you know, of all the theology that we can study and all the doctrine we can study and the propitiation for sin and all this and all that, he says, there's a four-year-old boy, and Jesus said, the reason I died was so that you could get to know my daddy. It says it all done it you have living water inside you now I can't say this I, I was I can't already tell this story without telling you that in Bible college we decided to go on a mission trip to the Havasu Canyon the Havasu Canyon is a tributary of the Grand Canyon and, and there's a city Havasu and then you had to walk in about 11 miles through and just incredible walk and hike and and then it opens up to this valley with these waterfalls that have lime and, and they make little whirlpools and it, it's just, it's kind of like an Alice in Wonderland going through the rabbit hole or something, you know, it's really awesome. And about 11 of us went down there and it was a heck of a trip, you know, it was one of our first, our first missionary trips and a lot of things happened. That's where I came across a car wreck and a little girl was not breathing on the day. They'd been there for about two hours and she wasn't breathing and and Bruce and I spoke over her and said, life, come back into that body. And we came back about five minutes later, and she was breathing, and they all made it. But uh, it was a heck of a trip. But, uh, um, there was a high school group down there camping uh, from Denver, and we actually knew some of the kids. It was a bizarre, but we'd gone to a church camp in Colorado, and we actually knew some of the kids who were in this, this school. And this, at that time, they were doing these big trips or doing something to keep kids in school. So they had a whole, and it ended up, we had a lot of ministry trying to share with these kids because they were, counselors would go into their tents and the kids would switch tents. I mean, it was a mess. Uh, but anyway, and this girl came up and there was one spigot there where you could get fresh water that wasn't full of lime because if you drank that other water, it was kind of like, you know, a laxative. And uh, so we we're, you know, trying to explain, you know, anyway, we're, we're getting our water jugs filled up at the spigot of water, and my brother-in-law, Bruce, he goes uh, to this young girl, he says, you know, you drink this water, you're going to be thirsty again. She says, yeah, no, it's not like the water in Colorado, and walked off. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I always think about him sitting there going, oh, I work for Jesus. <laughs> How come it didn't work for me? <laughs> anyway, I'll just throw that in. Verse 11, she said to him, sir, you have, oh no, I've already read that. Uh, verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me, the, uh, give me this water so I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. You know, our natural instinct is to look to God to answer our temporal problems. It really is. So many people come to Christ to get healed, to get their finances together, get their marriage together. You know, and the amazing thing is God will help you in all those things. But Really, that's not the most important thing. Those are really like the sugar in the vase. They're just the small little things that fill up your space while you're here on earth, but it's not a major thing in your life. You know, whether you go through this life wealthy, healthy, and vibrant, and all that really isn't. I mean, it's a great thing for you. But in the light of eternity, it's really one of the smallest things to be worried about. If you really think about it, you're going to be living for thousands, millions of years. 
and how you get through this life as far as your temporal blessings of healthy, wealthy, and all that really aren't too important, are they? I remember when C.T. Studd, uh, I was reading about him as a missionary to China, left a fortune to go be a missionary. He was uh, going to inherit a huge amount of money. He's a cricket, cricket player in uh, England. And he ended up going to China as a missionary, sleeping on a brick bed. But I remember reading that. My brother turned me on to that book when I was in high school. And I remember reading it. And he said that, you know, of all the gifts that God gives to mankind, he said, physical beauty is the least. But I remember as a high school kid saying, yeah, but it's still pretty important <laughs> to me. You know. And you know what I'm talking about? You know, it's like, yeah, I want to marry a gal that's got a great personality or anything else, but I also want her to look great. And yet, as life has gone on, I can tell you that all great bodies age. And like Les said, the bigger your muscles are when you're younger, the farther, farther they fall when you're older. <laughs> yeah. That was his recommendation not to work out. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I, as much as I love wealth and health, and, and uh, get, if we really think about it, folks, they're just not that important. You know, it's great to be able to pay your bills. Amen, hallelujah. It's great to have money to give. Amen, it's great to get what you want. It's all great. But, can, you know, just think about it. Those people that have lived Ah, I mean, outside of beyond the box of wealth. If they don't know Jesus, tell me how much comfort that's going to bring to them throughout eternity. I'm sorry, but my memories, I've got some wonderful memories, and my computer comes up and brings up the pictures of where I've been and all the people, and I love to look at that. But I'm telling you, if that's all you got... I tell you, I don't want to get to where I'm up in my 80s and 90s and, and sitting in some wheelchair looking at pictures of the past. I want to live to the last day I breathe. And as grateful as I am for my past, I, it, it doesn't comfort me all that much. I still want to live today. And that's in this lifetime. What about the next time when you're... You know, when you're in eternity. How important is all that? And I'm just saying that because you might want to, and you and I got to constantly renew our minds that this temporal world is not, not that big of a deal. But Jesus will still help us through it and help us win in every one of those. Amen? He is interested in our wealth. He is interested in our health. He will help us. But here he's trying to get across something way more important than Samaritan woman. But she's thinking, I just won't have to haul water no more if you give me some of that water. And he said to the, and he says, uh, go call your husband to come here. And the woman said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, You've, uh, you have well said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. And one whom you know now have is not your husband. This you've, you've said truly. Well, I'm telling you what, nothing's really new, is it? Holy cow, I mean, way back in, they had five husbands. And they're just living with a guy. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. <laughs> Our fathers worship in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said, A woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither, say neither. He says, We're neither in the mountain or in Jerusalem. Shall you worship the Father? You shall worship that which you know. You worship that which you do not know. We worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is. He was talking about what was happening right at that moment. An hour is coming, and now is when the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshippers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You know, to this day, there are certain people that want to worship in a certain place or a certain way. And Jesus was saying, there's coming a day where that's all past. And that day happened right then when Jesus came to the earth. 
we now don't worship in the mountain or in Jerusalem or in Tulsa or in any other Mecca city or in any other position. So there are people who want to pray in a certain position. You know, they're, I think they called uh, John, the Apostle John on camel knees because he knelt down so much. But, you know, that's great if you want to. But I'm telling you, I find, I find no spiritual power released by me kneeling. Just physical pain. My knees just don't take it. And you say, well, I just, it shows a humble heart. You know, there's a lot of ways to show a humble heart, and kneeling might be one of them. But I'm telling you, loving your neighbor as yourself and serving people is a lot more humble than having your knees calloused. I'm just saying there's, we got to remember some of the basics about Christianity. It is not about where you worship. It's not about what you do. It's not about the, we're going to do baptismal service. We do communion. But none of those things really count anymore like they did before because now you get to actually know God. You actually get to know Him. You actually get to talk with Him. He talks to you. You actually have a relationship with Him. You know, and the beautiful thing working in the Sela camp and seeing these kids is, is, is when you really do know and believe that God is speaking to them. And one of the things that we get to encourage them like we get to encourage each other is the fact that a lot of kids say, oh, I never heard God before. And a lot of kids talked about how they heard God on this camp. But I'm telling you, part of it was the fact God's been speaking all along. They just didn't recognize it. And some of what you've got to understand is you're not most likely going to hear a voice very often. I have never heard a voice. But I talk in such a way that it makes it sound like I've saw angels. And that I, you know, Andrew Walmack came up to me one day and said, John, I'm not like you. I've never seen angels like you've seen. And I, you know, I've always just had to see them with the eye of faith. And I said, Andrew, I'm sorry. I did not mean to mislead you. I have never seen an angel with these physical eyes. But I've seen angels. I've seen the Holy Ghost. I, I, I've seen, I, I've seen, and when I talk, I, you know, I've heard him. When I talk, it makes it sound like I heard a voice or I saw these things. And the reason why, it's because it's real. It's real to me. But it's not in this natural realm. I know there are some people that have seen angels with their eyes. They've seen, some people have heard God's voice with their ears. I have never done that. But I don't feel jealous at all. Because why? Because i got my relationship with God that's real every day. I, I, I'm not, I'm telling you, I'm not really hungry or wanting to hear God audibly. I'm not even wanting to see an angel with my physical eyes. I really don't think it'd do me any good. It might hinder me because my brain would go to work right away to, to deny it. But I'm telling you, with all the confidence in the world, my heart, I know I hear from God. And you, and you do too. And one of the greatest things we can do is just remind ourselves of the, simple vict- of the simple truth that God is a spirit and we are a spirit and that's where we're going to dwell and that's where we're going to communicate and that's where, it's, that's where the real deal is going to happen. The real deal doesn't happen out here with our sight and with our hearing out on this physical world. It's the, that's the temporal stuff that's going to all go away. The real stuff is what you feel in your heart. That's going to last forever. And to come to that confidence that you're actually hearing Him, it's an awesome thing. I've been walking, I don't, I'm not trying to brag or anything, I'm just saying, but you guys know what I'm talking about. For a lot of us, we've been doing it so long, it seems very natural. In fact, it seems, I, I walked into buildings now, I walked into the camp, and I had one thought when I walked in, you know, I saw all the tables and chairs, and I, I just, I don't know, it just came out of the blue, but I just thought, my, this is all kind of fake to me. These chairs that you're sitting on are, I know they're not fake, but I'm just saying, the world that we dwell in in our hearts with God, to me, has become more real than the chair that you're sitting on. Literally, it took years, but it's literally now. It's more real to me what's happening in my heart my relationship with God. Now, let me read to you a little portion of this. This little Colton was less than four years old when he, when he went to heaven. It took a few months before he even talked about his, his, his uh, trip. And then later on, this is probably about a year later, he says, um, they're just sitting around the table talking. Then mom asked Colton an odd question. This is his dad writing. Did Jesus say anything about your dad becoming a pastor? Now, this is probably a little bit more personal to me. But I think every one of you could take it personally if you'll just let yourself. 
God has asked you to do whatever you're doing. God doesn't have more favor on me because I'm a pastor than you as a business person or whatever, because all of us are ministers of the gospel all the time, full time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Say, I am a minister of the gospel. I've been called by God. Now, see, that's, you know, you say, well, John, I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I'm telling you it's true. Because the Bible says that. That if you're a new creature in Christ Jesus, old things have passed away, new things have come, and you have a ministry of reconciliation now to help people get to know their God. And this idea of, oh, I want to go in full-time ministry, you are in full-time ministry. I am in full-time ministry, whether I'm pastoring or building a house. And a lot of times I'm actually more effective building a house. But this still kind of touched me. He says, here's, here's a mother asking this little boy, did Jesus say anything about your dad becoming a pastor? Just as I was wondering privately why in the world something like uh, my vocation would even come up, Colton surprised me when he nodded enthusiastically. Oh, yes! Do you know, when people give you a compliment, a lot of you don't trust them. Amen? Because you, you put virtue on their, they're a nice person. And because they're a nice person and they're trying to do the right thing, they're just giving you a compliment because they are a nice person doing a nice thing. But you don't always value the compliment. Is that true? Because you think they're just being a nice person, saying a nice thing. But I find people value more when they hear that you said something about them to somebody else. My dad really never complimented us much. He was taught not to. Afraid we'd get proud and big-headed. He changed. When the teaching came to him, he changed. But he, 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 came, he and Mom came before all of us kids as we were older and grown up and said, we want to apologize we were taught not to ever brag on you and brag to you because it would give you a big head, and, and we missed it. But I can remember as a 20-year-old son, <clears throat> and I'm sure Dad probably said some good things. I just couldn't remember them. But I was working on the parsonage uh, for our church as a, car- as a carpenter. They hired me to fix it or remodel it. And there was two levels of floor. is several old, bu- I mean, old buildings put together. And I remember I worked really hard to blend the floors together so that you couldn't tell that there was a seam there. And my dad came that night after I'd left work and saw that and said to the pastor's wife, wow, John really did a good job on that. The next morning I showed up and this pastor's wife had discernment, I think, because the moment I walked in, she says, John, you should have heard what your dad said about how you fixed that seam. She was so excited to tell me, which tells me she understood something about people. And I'm telling you, it really, it really touched my heart that Dad bragged on me to somebody else. So here's this pastor. His wife says, did he say anything about you become, you know, your dad becoming a pastor? And he's thinking, oh, that don't need to be even asked. Why would Jesus even talk to my little four-year-old son about me being a pastor in three minutes? He said, oh, yes. Jesus said he went to Daddy and told him he wanted Daddy to be a pastor. And Daddy said yes. And Jesus was really happy. I just about fell out of my chair. That was true. I vividly remember the night it happened. I was 13 years old and attended a summer camp, youth camp in John Brown University in Arkansas. At one of the evening meetings, Reverend Butcher delivered, that's a heck of a name to be, uh, delivered a message about how God calls people to ministry and uses them to do his work all over the world. Pastor Butcher was short, bald, lively preacher, energetic and engaging, not dull and dry the way kids sometimes expect an older pastor to be. He challenged a group of 150 teenagers that night. There are some of you here tonight whom God could use as a pastor and missionaries. The memory of that moment of my life is one of those crystal clear ones, distilled and distinct, like the moment you graduate from high school or your first child is born. I remember that the crowd of kids faded away and the reverend's voice receded into the background. I felt a pressure on my heart. 
almost a whisper, that's you, Todd. That's what I want you to do. There was no doubt in my mind that I had just heard from God, and I was determined to obey. I turned back to the pastor just in time to hear him say that if any of us had heard from God that night, if any of us had made a commitment to serve him in the ministry, we should tell somebody about it. And when I got home uh, about it, when, when we got home, so that at least one other person would know. So when I got home from camp, I walked into the kitchen. Mom, I said, when I grow up, I'm going to be a pastor. Since that day, decades before, Mom and I had revisited that conversation a couple times, but we'd never told Colton about it. I guess what I liked about that was the fact that there are moments in your life that you just felt like you heard from God. But the reality that Jesus would tell this little boy, yes, I asked your dad to be a pastor at 13 years of age. And he said, yes, and it made me happy. That's powerful, isn't it? Selah camp. The kids heard from God. And Jesus was happy. Jess ministered a scripture about proving or learning what is pleasing to the Lord. You know, you can read that legalistically and think, oh, I just got to make him happy. I just got to make him happy. You know, they, like some of you went home and, and thought, boy, if mom isn't happy or dad isn't happy, it's going to be a horrible night. But that's not what we're talking about. We're just talking about when you want to make somebody happy. And when you do make them happy, it's just a joy. I know to this day to make my dad happy is one of my greatest joys. You know, my brother is just so clever with his words. If you've ever been around him, he's, he's hilarious. On my worst day, he can make me laugh. But when he starts telling something that makes my dad laugh, my dad gets that little giggle laugh, there's nothing greater, I don't think, on this earth for me than to watch my daddy laugh. And... My brother and I did a lot of things that didn't make Dad laugh. But the ones that we made him laugh are the really fondest memories. To think that you could actually make God laugh or happy. Ephesians 5.10 is that scripture where it just says, Proving and learning what is pleasing to the Lord. If in 1 Thessalonians 2.4, Paul talks about He says, man, we're not trying to please men. We're trying to please God. You can actually please God. Now think about it. It's not just the fact that you're going to go to heaven someday and he's going to hand you some checks or some money or some gold or something as a reward. But just think about right now, when you're making the right decisions, the Heavenly Father's watching you and it pleases him. When you have the right heart attitude, it pleases him. He turns to Jesus and they talk about it. There's a conversation going on. They're not dead waiting for us to get there to experience something. They are alive. They are talking. That's pretty cool. To think that you can actually make God happy, that is really awesome. In John 16, 13, the Bible says that the Spirit of God will guide you into true, all truth. Really, one of the ways you could say that is the Spirit of God will guide you or lead you into all reality. Truth is the real world. The Spirit of God will lead you into what's really happening. And when you get into what's really happening, this temporal world loses its power over you, and you can conquer it very easily. You can overcome it. I want to read just a couple scriptures, and then we'll close. First Chronicles. And like if you're like the kids, you're probably going to say, is that in the Old Testament or New Testament? Every question. Is that in the Old Testament or New Testament? That's in the Old Testament. First Chronicles 15. Verse 25. So it was David with the elders of Israel and the captains over thousands who went to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from the house uh, with joy. And it came about because God was helping the Levites who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord that they sacrificed seven bulls and seven rams. Now David was clothed in, clothed in a robe of fine linen, and he's, he's king here, with all the Levites who were carrying the ark, and the singers, uh, and Shanaah, and the leader, the leader of the singer, singing with the singers. David also wore an ephod of linen, 
Thus all Israel brought up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord with shouting and with sound of the horn, with trumpets and with loud sounding cymbals and harps and lyres. You know, the, the Ark of the Covenant represented the presence of God with people. And when they brought the Ark back into the presence of the people, there was this incredible party going on. And there was all kinds of shouting and loud noises. And this is where it happened that uh, David started dancing before the Lord, you know, and his wife saw him leaping and going crazy, and she despised him. Probably wasn't a real good night in their marriage, huh? But David wanted to please God. And let's go to, um, well, Psalms 5. In Ezra, it talks about when they relayed the foundation of the temple that the people began to shout and cheer. Said some of them were actually crying because it was such a pathetic uh, foundation compared to the original one, but you couldn't tell the difference between the two, the shouting and the crying. And then in Psalms 5, verse 11. But let all who take refuge in thee be glad. Let them ever sing for joy or shout for joy. And mayest thou shelter them, though, that those who love thy name may exalt in thee. Psalms 47. Verse 1, clap your hands, all peoples, shout to God with a voice of joy. Now, in Isaiah, in Luke, in Revelation, in Luke, it talks about how Jesus, ten lepers came to Jesus and said, you know, and he said, go show yourself to the priest, go do the ritual thing, but as they went... They were healed. I don't know about you, but, well, I do know about you. If you had leprosy, you'd probably get pretty happy if you got healed. Leprosy kills the nerve endings in your fingers and everything else. So you start laying your hands on hot things, and and then it starts eating literally chunks of your body off. It's a horrible disease. It, It makes you not want, you know, it's contagious, so you can't be around people. And that's one of the worst things. I remember when a... A guy with AIDS was leaving Fort Meade, and, and Bill ran to, to meet him because he got, that's when Bill was working out there, and went and gave him a hug, and the guy just wept. He said, Bill, of all the things I miss from this AIDS, what I miss the most is people touching me. When you had leprosy, nobody wanted to touch you. Casey Tim, one of the things that, you know, he had MS, and he just passed away about a month ago, but he said to me, his skin hurt so bad just to touch it. It just drove him crazy. His, you just couldn't touch him. And, the, and then in his last year, a nurse, a hospice nurse, figured out which drug to give him that actually stopped his eyes from moving, which could have happened for 20 years. And also it took away the pain from his, from his limbs so you could actually touch him. He said, it's great to be touched. These lepers, these 10 lepers were all healed. And it says one of them turned back and went to Jesus and with a loud voice, with a loud voice, with a loud voice, gave him glory. And Jesus said, where's the other nine? And of course, you can't be accountable for the other nine, can you? But Jesus said to him, go, be totally made whole. I believe any parts of his body that were missing were put back on. The others got healed of the leprosy. I believe this man got made whole. With a loud voice. It talks about in Revelations how they're with, a, with all the angels and the heavenly creatures. And there's heavenly creatures up there. The Bible says so. Weird creatures up there. Aubrey said a lot of them look like the Lord of the Rings type people. Things. I mean, not Lord of the Rings, but uh, Narnia. You know, uh, horses' bodies with eagles' heads and etc. And you go, oh, that's so weird. Well, get used to it. There's heavenly bodies up there. And it says they are all up there and they're all shouting, Worthy is the Lamb. They're shouting. Heaven's going to be noisy. 
for some people, they're going to be just totally stunned because they're so used to coming to church and being quiet. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. You guys are just a little hair better than the rest, but you're still not doing very well. You come into church, and you're, you know, Gabby, until we start, and it's like, oh, be quiet. Oh, be, don't, don't do that, you know. Man, heaven's going to be loud. Symbols are going to be loud. Earplugs are going to be free. Thank God you won't be able to lose your hearing, and <laughs> some of us from rock and roll don't hear so good no more. <laughs> Sitting in the very front. Last verse, Luke 10. We'll look at this one. Luke 10, 20. They'd just gone on. they just cast out the devils. They healed people. They did everything else. They came back. Jesus started listening to the stories. And the Bible says that he rejoiced, or what it means was he jumped up and spun around in circles, yelling and giggling. Can you see your Jesus doing that? These disciples, he sent them out, they came back, and the, uh, the Greek is very clear here, and it says that he rejoiced over them, which means Jesus jumped up, did the dance, shouting, laughing, and giggling over their good reports. Man, when heaven rejoices, it's not, oh, nice job. Right. You know, my son, learned, uh, Chase, started playing tennis, so we showed up. I did not know the rules. You know, first man shot, yeah! And it's like, everybody looked. And I go, and Lisa goes, what's that? I go, I don't know, I don't know. It was like everybody's in a morgue. And I found out in tennis, you never cheer. You don't shout. And it's like, why show up? It's, as bad, it's almost as bad on the golf course. Although we don't play by those rules, uh, especially people from believers. You can hear us all over the course, and sometimes it's not good. But Jesus stood up and danced and shouted when his disciples came back with good news. Verse 20, Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, but that, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. And he said, by the way, I'm all excited about what you guys did, but you've got to understand, what you really shout about is that your names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I've got a question for you today. Have you any reason to shout? I asked Elisa this morning, I'm going to tell her, and I said, you got any reason to shout? And she says, nope, not today. <laughs> And I thought, well, there's a real honest answer. I probably won't get that after preaching this sermon. We did that Wednesday night of the ceiling last night. We talked about shouting. And afterwards, we got some space and we start shouting. I shout a lot. I have a loud voice. Believe it or not, most of my shouting is in private. I shout way more in private than I do public. And I do a lot public. And I was told them about some of the times that I've shouted getting up on a mountain on a rock and shouting. And they went out right afterwards, found a rock and a cliff and started shouting. Alexis says, you got to come see this, Pastor John. And I never did get to go out there. We'll go back and visit that again, won't we? It's okay to shout publicly because they did it all through the Bible, and the Bible says it's one of our ways of worship. He said, you know, Jesus said, worship him in spirit and truth. And one of the ways we worship is through shouting. It's a real deal. And if you haven't done it, I encourage you to try it. It works real good in cars with air conditioning on and the windows rolled up. It works real good when you're in your shower and nobody's at home, or at least you don't think they're at home. It works real good if you can get out in the woods and think you're alone. But also works good if you just want to do it anytime you want to. It works phenomenal in church, but it's very rare. But it is allowed. 
It's part of worship. But there's something about that well of living water that's inside of you that bubbles up and brings eternal life. There's something about shouting that will blow the cork, so to speak, on that fountain. Literally, I've done it where I started shouting out of obedience and all of a sudden energy came into me. I've gotten healed. I've gotten restored. I've gotten over hurts. I've gotten vision. I've got so many things have happened when I shouted. So I just want to tell you, you're, you might want to shout sometime. And if you don't, you know, see if you can find a reason. And Jesus said, one of the greatest reasons is your name's written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. You're going to live forever. You're never going to die. You're going to know him forever. He's watching every move you make. He's talking to others about you up in heaven right now. When you make those decisions and you make those shouts, all heaven hears. Pretty awesome, isn't it? Well, let's be good Quakers and close out in a word of silent prayer. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.